All righty, very good. So uh, take it away, Jeff. Okay, thank you. You can see my laser pointer? Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I showed this uh, slide to my wife, and uh, she's a ham radio operator too. And the first thing she said is, title's all wrong. Ham radio operators are not regular folks. But uh, uh, I think uh, we're uh, uh, sufficiently special. This is uh, uh, a, a good thing for us. Uh, what I meant by uh, for us regular folks is I'm talking about the concepts of Maxwell's theory. I am not going to have any equations whatsoever in the entire presentation. It's all concepts, physical intuition. Uh, I'll talk about the discoveries that build up to Maxwell's theory. Uh, also, uh, people feel feel free to interrupt with questions. Uh, uh, I love the, the the feedback with a live audience, and it's a little harder virtually, but it can it can still work. So feel free to feel free to uh, interrupt and uh, to unmute and interrupt anytime you like. Um, uh, the discoveries that build up to Maxwell's theory and uh, concepts and understandings, as I said, will be emphasized. Absolutely no equations. Uh, I have a book which has all the equations in it if you want later on. I'll give book suggestions for further week reading and uh, sites to see if you go there, there being Edinburgh, which is where Edinburgh, Scotland, which is where Maxwell spent uh, much of his life. Um, I had a problem with this slide. Ancients had static electricity and they use cat fur and amber. Well, my wife and kids, uh, they dearly love cats. So uh, using cat fur would not, would, not, would not work with them, would not fly with them. And I don't have any amber. So instead I used the entire cat and styrofoam. And uh, uh, just so you know, the cat did uh, went in the box on its own and it uh, survived without any harm. But uh, the, the thing to look on this um, is the styrofoam, you know, we, we see this and yeah, it's kind of obvious. It's kind of a pain with the styrofoam peanuts sometimes uh, sticking to everything. Uh, but you sit there and you think about it. Why do they stick there? You, know, you don't know anything about, let's pretend you don't know anything about electrons and electric field and all that stuff. Uh, the styrofoam sticks to the cat fur. You know, that's, that's magic. How does that possibly happen? The ancients also had static magnetism. By static, I mean does not change with time. Uh, load, lodestone, I, I, which is uh, iron ore that got hit by lightning, is magnetic and tracks little bits of iron. And you rub the iron on the, on the lodestone, and you can magnetize a piece of iron. If it's an iron needle, you can make a compass. And you discover, wow, the earth is a magnet too, just like the lodestone. Why is that? And how does this work? Uh, I don't see anything at all uh, that uh, the lodestone is using. It's just, it's just magic. It's just hocus pocus. How could that possibly? There's not, I don't see anything that could do this. Um, and at this time, the ancients had no known connection between electricity and magnetism. They're two separate things. We've got el static electricity and we've got static magnetism, and they're just two completely separate things. And both are basically mysterious magic, hocus pocus. Uh, in 1799, uh, inspired by Galvani's report of twitching frog legs, Galvani uh, uh, said, uh, gee, it must be due to animal electricity somehow and uh, the twitching frog legs. Uh, uh, Volta figured out that it wasn't animal electricity, it was uh, the dissimilar metals in contact. And he built a, he built a stack of uh, zinc and copper plates separated by flannel. The flannel had been soaked in uh, a slightly uh, acid uh, liquid. And you could actually build up with a stack uh, of volta a voltaic stack like this, you could build up pretty substantial uh, voltage. Now we have a constant source of electricity. Static <laughs> electricity, you might get a zap out now and then, but uh, now you could have electricity. It just uh, it set up a current, and let it let it keep going and going and going. They don't know what current is, what electric current is. They don't know about electrons. It's just just it's really weird. What's happening here? It's you know mis totally mysterious. And uh, scientists can outperform all kinds of serious experiments. 
It also become uh, batteries are popular for uh, house parties to give uh, guests a, a shocking a shocking experience, and also for curing headaches and muscle pains. That's uh, something I don't think is done too much anymore these days. Uh, now, seventeen ninety nine. Give you some uh, 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 background here. Uh, Maxwell's equations are uh, formally published in 1865, the same year the Civil War ended. And uh, Richard Feynman, I don't have the exact quote, Richard Feynman said the, the Civil War uh, will, will fade thousands of years from now, will fade into the dust of history, and Maxwell's equations will still be shining brightly from uh, 1865. That's how important he felt it was. Okay, now we've got Hans Christian Orsted. <coughs> this is electricity to make a magnet. Here we see um, a little magnet. Uh, electrons, we know electrons today now, but they didn't know about electrons. Electrons flow are negative, and they flow from the negative terminal to the positive terminal. So the blue arrows is the physical direction of the electrons. Um, and almost all work today, if you do it, work, work with it mathematically, we uh, uh, put the direction of the current to be the direction if it were positive uh, electrons flowing around in the other direction. So mathematically, we'll always have current flowing in the opposite direction of the actual physical electron flow. Mm -hmm. So um, Orsted uh, put a loop of wire around one, one of uh, Volta's uh, uh, batteries and saw that uh, it twists the magnetic compass needle. And if you reverse the battery, it twists the magnetic compass needle in the other direction. <laughs> now this is really, really weird. You know, gravity, Newton had uh, worked in the, uh, the 1600s, late 1600s, gravity was an attractive force. Uh, static electricity was attractive or repulsive, depending on the kind of static electricities you were working with, positive or negative. And now, uh, and magnetic uh, forces are uh, attractive or repulsive as well. This is a twisting force. <coughs> got electricity flowing through, twisting the magnet. So now we see we see electricity is creating is creating a magnet. Essentially, we've got a magnet here. That is uh, moving the compass, twisting the, reaching out and twisting the compass. Again, we don't see anything connecting these things. We don't know about magnetic field yet. Magnetic field is totally unknown. <clears throat> so uh, these are the clues to a huge mystery uh, as to what's happening. Today, we, we let our kids make nail magnets. <laughs> and um, the, um, uh, well, make a magnet like this. Uh, oh, oh, mommy, mommy. My magnet doesn't work. What's wrong? And mom replies, little one, my, our Mac, James Clark Maxwell taught us that current must always flow in complete loops. If you have no complete loop, you have no current. If you have no current, you have no magnet. So we complete the loop and the magnet works. Uh, we'll go through that a couple of times. I'm kind of proud of these this two illustrations. I did them up on Adobe Illustrator. It, it took it took it took a full day to do to do each one, but uh, a lot of fun. Uh, but it illustrates electricity making a magnet. I'm not saying magnetic field now. I'm saying electricity makes a magnet because they don't know about magnetic field. Uh, nature likes symmetry, doesn't it? <laughs> Maybe there should be some way that uh, a magnet could make electricity. Can it work in reverse? Uh, well, let's give it a try. Uh, first, a word about uh, Faraday. Faraday uh, was born in a middle class family in England. In those days, middle class families, whether you go to a university or not, depending on what class of society you're in, <laughs> middle class families do not send their children to universities. His father died, tragically, when he was nine years old. And so Michael was apprenticed to a bookbinder. The bookbinder, some of the books he was binding, one was Encyclopedia Britannica. 
Faraday started reading articles in the books, the, the Encyclopedia Britannica that he was uh, binding, and uh, a couple uh, uh, articles, particularly on chemistry and electricity, he found absolutely amazing. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's a long story, but he managed to get in good with Humphrey Davy of uh, the Royal Institution. Um, Humphrey Davy kind of took him under his wings and uh, uh, provided him with laboratory. And, and one of the first things he did, he actually used electricity to create a very simple motor. He published a paper on it, and Humphrey Davy was quite upset because Faraday forgot to... Uh, uh, reference uh, Humphrey Davies uh, work in this area. So he shut Faraday down on electricity and told him to work on chemistry for mm -hmm. 10 years. He did some fantastic stuff in chemistry, but um, at 10 years later, he comes back and uh, returns to electricity. So he, he's uh, encountered this question here. Um, uh, um, he sees uh, electricity can make a magnet. Now, can a magnet make electricity? So he tries. He sets up this this uh, setup right here. He has a, 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 an electromagnet, a voltage battery, creating a magnet. Now, can this magnet create electricity over here in the other uh, electromagnet? And he tries and tries and tries. It just doesn't work. You know, sometimes you you can't. You got to go with evidence here. We're in engineering and science. You've got to go with evidence. You can't just believe what you want to believe. You got to believe what the what the experiments tell you. An experiment tells you it doesn't look at the look at the meter. The meter is at zero, flat line zero. It just doesn't work. We're wasting the battery here. Okay, let's let's open the switch, and um, and and we'll get on with life. Uh, hold on. Did anyone see that? <laughs> Speak up. Anyone see that? Someone on mute, tell me if you saw it. Did you see it something negative? Happened? Yep, we it saw it. Negative. Yeah, excellent. Good. Yes, it, uh, the meter, but wait a minute, the meter's back to zero now. But we disconnected the electromagnet and that made electricity. How does disconnecting an electromagnetic make electricity? Well, let's connect it back up and see what happens. Holy cow. Did anyone see that? What happened? Yeah, it moved the meter again. Which way? To the positive. Yeah, it went positive. Cool. What is going on here? Let's, let's run this. Maybe it's just a glitch. Maybe we're just seeing what we want to see. Let's, let's run this again. Sure enough, we open it up and it, it, the meter goes negative. We close it. Whoa, the meter goes positive. Is that cool or what? We'll do it one more time. <laughs> meter goes negative. This is a that's one important for a, a scientific experiment. It must be repeatable. We must be able to get the same result if we repeat the experiment, and we certainly do. It works beautifully. Okay, Faraday, no mathematical ability, but he has superb mm -hmm. physical intuition. So he speculates there must be some sort of mysterious, invisible, he called it the electrotonic state that surrounds the magnets. Now you can imagine all his scientific friends. Yeah, Faraday, you've, you've lost it. You're, you're, you're going insane. The mysterious, <laughs> mystical, electrotonic state that surrounds the magnets. Yeah, right. Uh, today, uh, any, if there's any electromagnetics experts there, uh, the correct name for this electrotonic state is magnetic uh, vector potential field. I'm going to shorten that for this presentation a little simpler. I'll just call it magnetic field. It's not quite the magnetic field. It's almost the same thing. But for practical purposes, well, it's, it's the magnetic field. And what Faraday, Faraday invented the concept of a field, of, which is uh, mathematically a vector defined at all points in space. It can be different no matter where you, you, you move from one place to another, the vector can change. The electric field can change, the voltage can change, the magnetic field can change, and they all have direction and magnitude. 
Okay, we call it the magnetic field. And um, Eve speculated it is changes <laughs> in this electrotonic state that causes these amazing electromagnetic effects. And we can make the changes by, uh, by turning the magnet on or off, or as illustrated here, by just moving the magnet in and out. Move the magnet in and out, though the small coil move it into the big coil and it, and it uh, move the small coil into the big coil and it would make a, a reading on the, uh, I guess this must be an ammeter of some kind over here. Uh, and you do that repeatedly and you can get it going back and forth. What What is this? Anybody know what this is called today? It's called a generator or a dynamo. We're, we're using moving magnets <clears throat> to make electricity. That's a generator. We use one of these every field day. This is this print, the exact principle that every generator works on is a, a moving magnet makes electricity. And that's what we use to do our field day operations. And that's what, that's what provides the electricity that comes out of our wall outlet, only it's much bigger generators. And they also refine motors. So now you have motors and uh, generators and um, <clears throat> young, young Miss, Matt Maxwell, this is 1831, I believe. Uh, Maxwell is just literally a babe in arms, in his mother arms, literally, when Faraday makes this discovery. And uh, they start making generators and, uh, and motors. And uh, as a young boy, Maxwell, there's even a letter where Maxwell talks about uh, to his parents talks about going to see uh, his father took him on a on a tour to um, see some electromagnetic machines in a factory. So he's uh, this is this is this is what Maxwell is getting uh, is getting introduced to as a child. <clears throat> uh, so as I mentioned, Faraday has absolutely no mathematical ability, no university education, but superb physical intuition. Maxwell sits down, and this is what you do with good science. You learn everything you can about what has already been done on uh, EM research, Faraday, Ampere, Orsted, Volta, and many others. Faraday, of course, uh, today we have uh, Farad, the unit of capacitance. Ampere is unit of current, Orsted is unit of magnetism, Volta is unit of volt, unit of voltage. Uh, a, a little side note here, Maxwell uh, was against, spoke against using uh, uh, the na Ampere's name for the unit of current. They were deciding what, what should we call current? Uh, what should we measure it? We'll measure it in Ampere's. And the reason he was against that was because he had so much respect for the work of Ampere, he was afraid that people would show disrespect for Ampere by shortening the name of the unit of current to amps. And of course, that's exactly what has happened. <laughs> okay, Faraday's intuition is a changing electrotonic state makes electricity. Maxwell's math, oh, those of you who, some of you might know, might be familiar with differential calculus. You'll know what, the, what kind of equation I'm talking about when I say changing with time, the <laughs> electrotonic state makes electricity. Maxwell's math, changing with time, magnetic field, makes an electric field. And what Maxwell wonders here, this is, this is the part that Ma Maxwell took a lot of previous work and put it into his mathematics. And um, the part that Maxwell himself actually came up with uh, is he wondered if a changing electric field, does this work in reverse? Does a changing electric field, changing with time, the electric field, does that chain make a magnetic field? And uh, that, that's the big part that Maxwell added. We don't know how Maxwell came up with this. Uh, some people say, say uh, the historians say, is um, some, you know, uh, somebody who doesn't study this, uh, doesn't, doesn't study the history will say, well, Maxwell saw the obvious uh, symmetry here. And uh, he added, uh, added the symmetric term in, in all his equations. But uh, we don't have any, and there's no notebooks, no letters, no comments at all on how, how he uh, figured out the uh, changing electric field. And the symmetry in the form that Maxwell wrote his equations was actually 20 equations in 20 variables. And 
there is no obvious symmetry in those equations. So how he came up with this, uh, uh, the historian just kind of shrugged their shoulders and said, yeah, he's a genius. And uh, that, that, that's the amazing part. Okay, changing electric field makes a magnetic field. And this is something we work with all the time in ham radio. Here we see electric current, a capacitor, this is a capacitor side view, the electric current, the green arrow, flows down the lead into the capacitor. Then we have electric field, the red arrows, and the dielectric capacitor, and that goes to green, the current going down. The direction of the arrow is the direction of mathematical current. So a right-hand rule points your thumb along the green arrow, and your fingers curve in the direction that the magnetic field circles around the wire. That does it on the lead coming in, does it on the lead going out. Let's say we've got one megahertz, uh, one amp at one megahertz coming in. There'll be one amp at one megahertz coming out. Um, hold on. Where's the current in the dielectric? Maxwell said the current must be in complete loops. There's zero current here, zero conduction current. What's What the heck is going on here? But hold on, we have a changing electric field. DC current won't go through the dielectric. We have a changing electric field, say it's one megahertz. We have a changing electric field in the dielectric. Changing electric field makes a magnetic field going around. The magnitude of the magnetic field, Maxwell suggested, and through his equations, is exactly the same as the magnetic field created by the one amp of conduction current up here and one amp of conduction current down here. This is called today, this is called displacement current. And uh, uh, we have one amp of conduction current in the conductor, one amp of displacement current in the dielectric, and one amp of conduction current in the conductor. So now we have current flowing in a complete loop, including through the dielectric, as long as we include displacement current. <coughs> Excuse me. Sometimes this is called polarization due to polarization of the dielectric. You have polar molecules and the positive side goes, keep, the polar molecules keep flipping back and forth <coughs> to uh, create, create our dielectric constant. And uh, uh, what's, what's amazing to me is this uh, uh, displacement current occurs even if the dielectric of the capacitor is a vacuum. There's nothing in there to flip around. You still have the polarization current. You still have a magnetic field around it. The changing electric field makes a magnetic field. And, uh, and so Maxwell put this stuff in a bunch of equations and Let's start out with our source. We'll imagine an HT. This is the electric field. Now, a little bit of caution here. The electric field is not a arrow stick sticking out of your HT. What it is, the electric field, I'm drawing the electric field. This is uh, uh, from your HT, that, that's your transmitter creating this electric field. That's what the transmitter creates. It creates a voltage across the, the terminals. That, the voltage makes an electric field. The electric field is at that point, right at the base of the arrow. It's not a stick sticking out. I have the stick sticking out here drawn that way to indicate how much electric field there is. So if there's say 100 volts, it'll be the, the electric field will be that long. It'll be high electric field, but it's just at that point. And when it's 50 volts, I'll draw the arrow half the length. When it's zero volts, there's zero arrow. When it's negative 50 volts, it'll be half, I'll draw the arrow half halfway in the other direction. Let's watch that again. And so it's a, it's a one complete cycle. This is a cosine wave as opposed to a sine wave. So uh, that, that's what the, now we have an electric field here at the terminals. It's an electric field at the terminals, here at your antenna terminals, that's changing with time. Now remember, what Maxwell said, an electric field that changes with time creates a magnetic field. Okay, let's see what happens now. Okay, there's the magnetic field. Something funny about that magnetic field. Look at that, negative magnetic field, positive. 
positive electric field makes positive magnetic field and negative electric field negative electric field creates negative magnetic field the magnetic field is at right angles to the electric field faraday didn't have that but with all the other research research results that maxwell put into maxwell's equations that comes out that, that, that comes right out of the equations. The electric and magnetic field are at right angles to each other. Always. There are no exceptions to this. Uh, uh, well, okay, one exception. If it's static electric field, you can have a static magnet and a static electric field. You can point them in any direction you want. But in that case, Maxwell's equations are decoupled. So for time-varying fields, anything that's RF, the electric and magnetic fields are always at right angles to each other. Now, remember the electric field creates a magnetic field, changing electric field creates a magnetic field. It, it creates an electric, the uh, changing electric field creates a magnetic field that changes with distance. Those of you who know uh, a little bit of calculus, changes with distance you'll know what what uh, what uh changing electric field makes a uh a magnetic notice this magnetic field is a little longer than the other magnetic than the, the magnetic field that's being generated by the uh source here we're one time step further on now this is not at the same time we're one time step further on the original magnetic field is created uh, here, and it's moved over over to the right. And uh, we have a new magnetic field here. Now that original magnetic field creates a new elect creates an uh, electric field as well. Hold on a second here. Okay. Uh, so we've got electric field that creates a magnetic field a little further away. Magnetic field that creates electric field a little further away. The electric field is creates magnetic field because field creates an electric the uh, electric field that's changing with time and changing with distance. Everything's changing with time and distance. The, you get get an idea of some of the complexity here. We've got to have things that are changing with both time and distance to get this kind of uh, do -si do dance going. And so it keeps on going. Each electric field creates more magnetic field, and on and on and on. How, how whoa? How how far can it go? Well, it will if as long as nothing gets in the way. This can go on forever. Each electric field is creating a magnetic field. You've got to have the electric field and magnetic field, each changing with time and changing with distance in just the right way. And uh, Maxwell looked at that and said, uh, do, could we ever create something like that? Um, this seems kind of complicated to get all those electric fields and magnetic fields all dancing together at the same same time. And then um, uh, Heinrich Hertz figured out you could just do it by making sparks. And he verified Maxwell's equations 24 years after Maxwell published them. People are looking at Faraday as kind of a little bit crazy on electromagnetics and Maxwell. Yeah, Maxwell, you did a great job in thermodynamics and Saturn's rings and and by the way, the RGB monitors, Maxwell figured out RGB, all kinds of stuff. But yeah, electromagnetics, yeah, you, you missed the boat there. But Hertz figured out uh, that Maxwell's equations were actually right, experimentally verified it. Marconi went on to commercialize it. And uh, uh, I got into uh, ham radio. My father had a uh, rig that he had built, a pair of 807s. Uh, prior to World War II, and I, I looked at it and I said, Dad, what what is that stuff? And he says, oh, that's my ham radio gear. You can talk to people all over the world with it. 
And that just absolutely floored me. I was totally amazed with that. And I became obsessed with figuring out how all that stuff worked. And today we all carry around in our pockets or in our vicinity a radio that we can use to talk to people all over the world. Everyone does, pretty much. And I'll, I'll run through this animation again a couple more times. You see how it if it's changed, the electric field and magnetic field are both changing with time. They're at exactly at right angles to each other. Why is that? I don't know why that is. That's amazing. Uh, you can get this wave that that uh, a traveling wave that propagates. Maxwell sat down when he came up with the equations. He sat down. Uh, there's something called epsilon and mu, the, the dielectric constant for the dielectric capacitor and the magnetic permeability for uh, for the inductor. You can take epsilon and mu of free space and calculate the speed of this electromagnetic wave. And then he compared it to the measured, mechanically measured speed of light. And they were almost exactly the same answer. So from that, he concluded, wow, light must be an electromagnetic wave. And notice also the oscillations are transverse to the direction of propagation. Sound waves, they're longitudinal uh, oscillations. The, um, the oscillations for sound waves push back and forth toward, to, toward the listener and away from the listener. Electromagnetic waves are transverse. They oscillate sideways as they, uh, wow. How how can that be? This I, I one one thing I'm fond of saying sometimes is um, we are so fortunate to have been born into the most incredible universe no, ever known to humankind. It is an amazing place. How how far can they go? Well, uh, I don't. We can't test forever because the universe hasn't been around forever. The universe has been around for best as we can tell, 13.7 billion years. And uh, Hubble, this is the Hubble Deep Field. They they put put the Hubble Telescope on one spot in the sky near the constellation Cygnus, for those who are familiar with astronomy, and just let it gather light day after day after day after day. And uh, the farthest galaxy they saw in that deep field was 13.2 light, billion light years away. It's right in the center of this square, which is magnified over here to the top right. And then that, that little red... Uh, a galaxy there that's the magnified down here 13 point as long as nothing gets in the way the electromagnetic waves can travel forever uh it's truly amazing okay <clears throat> now i've been talking about maxwell's here i've been using maxwell's equations and theory for almost 40 years now it works great uh except there's one problem maxwell's theory is wrong it's just plain wrong. It doesn't work. It, Maxwell's theory uh, fails for low, very low, lower, even lower yet, very, very, very low power. In other words, when you get down to the level of counting individual photons, there are no photons in Maxwell's theory. You can have an electromagnetic wave with the energy of, uh, you know, a photon has a certain amount of energy and um depending on the frequency and you can you can in maxwell's theory no problem having an electromagnetic wave that has the energy of two-thirds of a photon but you can't have two-thirds of a photon you can have one photon or two photons it's quantized or three or four that's be an integer number of photons there are no photons in maxwell's theory so if you get down to where you're counting individual photons a maxwell's theory doesn't apply anymore and um uh, instead, something called QED, quantum electrodynamics, which uh, includes uh, photon-electron interactions and is very probabilistic and completely counter to physical, everyday physical intuition. Quantum theory does that. It includes photons and all other electromagnetic effects. QED is very hard to use for RF. Huge uh, amount of calculations. And we can come up with uh, essentially exact answers for almost all uh, RF problems with Maxwell's theory. So we stick with Maxwell's theory for just about everything. And um, uh, if you want to read about it, and there's uh, no equations in this book either, Richard Feynman, famous physicist, uh, uh, very famous for explaining things, uh, complicated things, and he explains it well. I, I should have seen that. That makes sense. A lot of books uh, that... Uh, 
were uh, uh, originated from Richard Feynman. Strange theory of light, uh, QED, the strange theory of light and matter. Uh, check that book out if you'd like to uh, read up more about it, especially if you spend any time uh, professionally working with Maxwell's equations. This will give you a lot of a lot of really neat background. Another book that I spent quite a bit of time with is uh, Maxwell Biography. It was published in 1882 by authors who knew Maxwell personally, especially uh, Lewis Campbell, and uh, from from uh, Maxwell's uh, youth, in fact. And uh, this, when I got hold of it, it was available only in the rare book rooms of large libraries. So I did a high quality, I, I scanned it, OCR'd it, uh, formatted it, did the, the whole, it was quite a bit of work. Did a high quality reprint. If you'd like to get hold of this, The Life of James Clark Maxwell, add the word illustrated on there, because there are a couple other reprints where they just scan the, uh, scan the pages, and those are very hard to read. Uh, uh, and uh, the the uh, background, by the way, is Maxwell tartan, or uh, sometimes we uh, America as Americans we call it a plaid. This is the Maxwell tartan for the Maxwell clan. Uh, on Amazon and Kindle, paperback and hardcover, it uh, concentrates a lot on his childhood. Uh, in, in a lot of humorous anecdotes, uh, not a lot of theory, uh, and I uh, don't think there are any equations in it either. I also have many other articles uh, that I've written about Maxwell on our uh, company website, sonnetsoftware.com. Just go to the uh, Maxwell biography section. And uh, this is a picture of Glen Lair, where Maxwell, Maxwell's country estate, where he spent a lot of time. And as I mentioned earlier, I spent nearly four decades working in depth with Maxwell's theory, uh, implementing them on a computer, something called numerical electromagnetics. If you have a planar circuit, you can put the circuit, instead of a, a cut and try to try to get the filter response right where you want, you can put the circuit on the computer. Computer crunches it and um, it tells you what the response is going to be without building it. And for uh, the silicon RFICs and gallium arsenide RFICs, uh, when it takes uh, uh, tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, or even a million dollars per wafer spin, you don't want to do too much trial and error. You want to make all your mistakes on the computer. Turn the circuit up, circuit up on the computer. Okay, four decades. If you're okay with math, it uses nothing more than sines and cosines and uh, some some vector cal. Oh, there's an equation. I said there are no equations. Got an equation in the cover of the book. Okay, that's the kind of equation we deal with all the time. If that's something you you feel like could be a friend, this will be a, a book for you. If you, if that book looks if that looks like uh, an enemy, uh, uh, enjoy the anecdotes in the book, but uh, the equations won't won't be of much use to you. And I have that on Amazon in paperback and hardcover. That was my COVID project. I spent uh, uh, forty you know, almost forty years worth of theory. I spent uh, COVID uh, uh, developing that and uh, and printing it up. If you go to Scotland, and if you're really into uh, uh, RF, microwaves, the electromagnetics, that sort of thing, I highly recommend this. This is at the Maxwell statue in Edinburgh. Uh, <clears throat> it's on the end of George Street. They're moving it a little bit here. Uh, the, the George Street area is getting um, uh, reworked quite a bit, but it'll be close by there. Uh, this little uh, disc is... Um, Maxwell's color wheel, where he, which he used to figure out that RGB are the primary colors of light, and that's what we use on our monitors today. And I have an article about the statue at uh, sonnetsoftware.com. The title of the article is Toby's Statue, Spoiler Alert. Toby is the name of the dog. Maxwell always had a dog. And the end of the article, I'll, I won't, won't spoil this one, but uh, the end of the article, uh, uh, based on Toby, uh, is uh, a, 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 a put a twist in there that uh, if you have a high degree of empathy, you'll walk away crying. I have <laughs> I can't, it's hard to talk about it, just to even thinking about it. It'll be a very moving article for you. Um, and my my name is actually uh, on a little little tiny plaque in the back. I was a donor along with about uh, 20 or 30 other donors. Uh, my name is uh, quite an honor, right? Is right listed right underneath uh, Erwin Jacobs, who's the founder of Qualcomm. So it's a uh, uh, kind of neat. Uh, by all means, uh, check out this statue if you go to Edinburgh. 
a short walk from uh, the statue, maybe 15 minutes, 14 India Street, that is Maxwell's birth home. There's a fantastic museum in the first and second floors here. Uh, they call it ground floor and first floor in, in uh, Britain. And uh, uh, be prepared to spend at least four hours there. Uh, it's not open on regular hours, but if you get in touch with the Clark Maxwell Foundation org, I'm a trustee of that organization, that trust, by the way. Um, uh, they will uh, be very happy to fix you up with a private uh, guide and and uh, show you around and uh, let you look at look to your heart's content. Call ahead for reservations. And Maxwell, by the way, that uh, take a guess how much that uh, building is, uh, was paid for about uh, 40 years ago. One million pounds. Uh, real estate's very expensive in this part of Edinburgh. No telling what it's worth today. We're very fortunate to have that in the hands of the foundation. Maxwell's estate, this is how I first saw it in 2006. Extreme rural southwestern Scotland, a small village called Castle Douglas near Dumfries. Uh, take your GPS if you drive there. Uh, it's a, a couple hour drive to get there. Uh, you can take part of the trip by train if you want. Uh, if you uh, do go, if you do go to uh, Glen Lair, be sure and stop in Lockerbie. They have uh, very nice memorials for the uh, tragedy that happened in 1988 there, which I have difficulty talking about even today. Uh, fire in I think it was 1912 or 1928, something like that, left Glen Lair close to uh, total collapse, as you can see here. This is how I first saw it in 2006. Uh, this is what it looks like today. Uh, this this portion was built by Maxwell's father. It's been <clears throat> uh, most of the right hand portion has been uh, entirely restored as a private residence. <clears throat> the large uh, great room and the rest of the building is Maxwell's uh, was built by Maxwell. Uh, the roof was in danger of collapse. We had all this, all the uh, slate shingles removed, uh, all the rafters completely replaced. The shingles were put back exactly as they had been taken off. The people who were doing this were really class. The stones needed repointing. The, the, the cement holding them together was, was rapidly decaying. They were repointed. We put windows in, uh, cleaned things up. There's a nice little visitor center here with some uh, beautiful exhibits in the entry foyer and, uh, uh, the door was a door that Maxwell used. The steps are the steps that Maxwell would have uh, uh, climbed up. Uh, they had to pull the steps out of the garden in the back. Uh, uh, call ahead, uh, glenlair.org.uk. Uh, Captain Duck, retired uh, British Navy, Duncan Ferguson, uh, owns the, uh, owns the uh, building. We work closely with him in uh, restoring it. And he tells a funny story. Uh, he was, he's an electrical engineering by training and uh, he walked up to the professor teaching him an electromagnetics, electromagnetics class and he said, well, you know, I, I live in uh, Maxwell's home in uh, Glen Lair. And the professor didn't believe him. <laughs> yeah, you're kidding me. Yeah, you're yeah, right. No, he really did. But if we hadn't taken action on this, and it was uh, fairly expensive too, uh, it would just be a pile of rubble today. In conclusion, uh, first off, uh, this is a, a sketch of Maxwell at about two or three years old, and look at those eyes. You can see they're full of uh, full of energy. This kid's going to be going to be a handful, and he's going to be curious about everything. He's clutching on an owl. Uh, his aunt, his uh, cousin uh, Jemima Blackburn uh, had two owls, so I think it's actually this is this is actually a real owl that, she, and she's a world class artist. She did the sketch. And look at the expression of the owl's eyes. The owl is terrified. Uh, Maxwell did go through life with all five digits on both hands. It looks like they missed the thumb for the sketch, though. In conclusion, ancients knew about static electricity and magnetism. It was just pure mystery. No idea what's happening here. Volta developed the battery. And now all of a sudden, we got a, a, a source of DC electricity. 
And Orsted discovered electricity. This electricity can make magnetism. It starts twisting compass. It doesn't attract them or repel it. It twists them around. What the heck is going on? Faraday discovered magnetism can create electricity. Uh, suggests the electrotonic state surrounding magnetism creates the electricity, changing the electrotonic state. Uh, uh, yeah, right, Faraday. Yeah, sure. Prove it. Uh, Maxwell put all this into a precise math mathematical theory, which Hertz verified experimentally and Marconi commercialized, and today we use on a daily basis. And this, this theory has been critical in creating, I think, essentially all, I can't think of any exceptions, all of today's technology. Thank you for your kind attention. Very good, thank you, Jim. Does anyone uh, have any uh, questions what? for Jim? Any questions? Yeah, go, uh, go ahead. Did you have a question or? I'm actually going to stop the recording here. Yeah.